All right. Um, thank you uh, so much for uh, joining me today, everybody. It's my great pleasure to welcome Jean-Francois Joll, and uh, he is at the uh, Institut de Mathematique de Bordeaux, and he is going to tell us something about FISTA uh, as an automatic geometrically optimized algorithm for strongly convex functions. So please take it away. Well, thank you very much, Stefan, for the introduction. I'm very pleased to, to be able to give, to give a talk here in this seminar. Uh, so um, I'm from Bordeaux University in France, and this is some joint work with Charles Dossal and Audron Pierre, who are both in Toulouse, also in France. So um, uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, optimization, and the setting will be the following. I will consider a function uh, big F, and uh, I will assume that it's a composite optimization problem in the sense that big F will be uh, the sum of two functions, small f and small h. And uh, for the sake of simplicity, uh, we will consider the, only the case when uh, we consider a function defined on Rn. Uh, of course, if you want to make uh, things more complicated, you can go to separable Hilbert space and everything will work perfectly fine. But just for the for here to understand the, the basic uh, motivations, Rn will be enough. Um, then, so I have two functions, uh, small f and small h. So small f will be uh, the nice guy. f will be a convex differentiable function. So uh when you're a convex differentiable function uh, it's equivalent to the fact that uh you have the inequality here uh hope you can see my mouse um so it means that uh, you're above the linear approximation of your function uh so that's the character the first order characterization of a convex function um well, in one d it just means that your function is above the tangent and also on F, I will assume that it has an L Lipschitz gradient. So uh, why is this important in particular? Because uh, if I have a convex differentiable function with L Lipschitz gradient, then I have the fact that my function is always bounded by this um, quadratic approximation. So it's very nice to have a convex differentiable, differentiable function with L Lipschitz gradient because you're always between your linear approximation below and this quadratic approximation from above. So if you can um, it, uh, if you can do um, control the linear approximation and the quadratic approximation, in fact, you can control your function. So it's um, that's why I call F the, the nice guy. And then, of course, as always, you have a bad guy and the bad guy here will be H. So uh, this function will be uh, still convex, but only lower semi-continuous. And so to, with respect to the, the, what you asked uh, at the beginning of the talk, uh, that's the function in which I will in, in, uh, incorporate um, constraint. Um, uh, if I have some, some constraint issues on the optimization problem, I will put the constraint within the H function. And h, I will assume that it's a simple function. So uh, I'll get back to that later. But uh, it means that I will be able to compute easily its uh, proximal operator. And the basic problem I will have in mind will be uh, the lasso problem. In fact, the lasso problem is this one, where you want to minimize some L2 uh, that data term plus some L1 regularization. And so, what I want is that all the results I'm going to present uh, can be used to minimize this type of function. And uh, well, as you know, there are a lot of applications in major signal processing or more generally in machine learning or deep learning. Uh, these uh, optimization methods that we present, in fact, are a um, basic step in the, the optimization solver used in machine learning. So before I go further, uh, are there some questions about the setting? If not, I'll uh, keep going. Um, so, oops, yep. 
um, I will make some uh, other assumptions. Uh, I will assume uh, that I have a quadratic growth uh, condition at my function f that I want to minimize. And this quadratic growth condition, uh, so that we call g2 mu, uh, states that my function grows at least uh, as a quadratic function close to the set of its minimizer. So x star is a minimizer and close to x star, you, you want to grow at, at, at least as a quadratic function. So this quadratic growth condition may uh, appear to be quite weird, but in fact, you can see it as just a recreation of a classical property, which is the strong convexity property. If you have a strong convex, strongly convex function differentiable, then your function is strongly convex if and only if you have this inequality. So here, the first free term, you recognize exactly the um, convexity inequality at the first order. And when you're strongly convex, it means that you are more convex, uh, more convex than just uh, convex, you're strongly convex, you can add uh, an L2 term. So it means that if you're strongly convex, you are not simply above your linear approximation, you're above a quadratic approximation. And so if you have a, um, a strongly convex function with a L Lipschitz gradient, then you have uh, an upper and a lower uh, quadratic uh, bound. And so it means that uh, in, the, in that case, if you know how to, do, to deal with a quadratic function, then you, you can do everything you want with strongly convex functions with a Lipschitz gradient. But this quadratic growth condition is weaker. It's not equivalent. Uh, the, the strong convexity assumption implies the quadratic growth condition, but uh, the opposite is not true. And if I'm back to my um, classic, well, classic model problem, those lasso, lasso problem, if the operator A within the L2 data term is invertible, then uh, I know it's straightforward to see that F is mu strongly convex. But if F is not injective, then uh, it's uh, straightforward to see that F is not strongly convex, but uh, it's a, a lot of more work, but you can show that F is, uh, however, uh, as a quadratic growth. And so uh, it means that with this uh, quadratic growth condition, we will be able to, to deal with the lasso problem, even if the operator A is not invertible. So for those who are familiar with it, this quadratic growth condition uh, in the convex case is equivalent to what is called the Loyasevitz property with exponent one over two. In fact, uh, the, um, if your function uh, satisfies this quadratic growth condition that I've introduced, you can show that it's the same, it's completely equivalent if f is convex uh, to the fact that you have this uh, control over f of x minus f of x star. So x star is a minimum a minimizer, sorry. That means that uh, f of x minus f of x star is controlled by the norm of the gradient of f in x. So the, the, it's just that uh, I feel like the, the, the quadratic growth condition is geometrically more uh, intuitive, but in the convex uh, case, these two conditions are completely equivalent. And the, the key uh, property of the functional we are going to minimize will be what I will call the conditioning and which will I will denote by K, uh, by kappa, sorry. <laughs> so kappa will be in fact mu over L where mu is the quadratic growth uh, parameter or uh, the strongly convex parameter if you're strongly convex. And L will be the Lipschitz constant of the, uh, the, um, of the gradient of the small f. And in fact, uh, this mu over L will be some kind of uh, measure of the anisotropy of the problem you consider. Uh, if you have a, a quadratic functional, in fact, mu is just the smallest eigenvalue of the Asian of your uh, functional, and L is just the largest eigenvalue. And so the, the, this ratio mu over L is just a way of uh, understanding how anisotrope your problem is. And since we are going to deal with uh, large scale optimization problems, 
in large scale optimization, uh, we always have to deal with anisotropic optimization. And so kappa will be uh, very small. In fact, kappa will be a small O of one. Also, uh, since we deal with large scale optimization, uh, we will only consider first order optimization methods. That is that we will only uh, allow ourselves to access to the gradient of the function or uh, subgradient and the value of the function itself. But we don't, won't be able to use information, higher information such as uh, the Laplace, the, the, the Asian matrix, for instance. Uh, here, uh, in large scale optimization, uh, computing the gradient is already uh, computationally uh, enough. And um, I will assume all the time that uh, my minimization problem has a solution. I, I won't, uh, this will be an assumption. And the only um, problem I will be considering is how fast uh, the algorithm I, I, uh, I use converges to this solution. And I will uh, measure the, 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 the speed of convergence toward this solution uh, by using, in fact, the decrease of the, va the functional value. So my, my speed of, uh, of convergence will be measured by f of x n minus f of x star. Okay, so that's, uh, of course, that's not uh, f of x n minus f of x star is not x n minus x star, so it's weaker, but it's just that in convex optimization, that's the quantity you can control easily. And so you, you get all the control you, you want on this, uh, the, the functional value. And uh, of course, if you are a further assumption of the function, well, if it's coercive or something like that, then you, you have access to Xn minus X star. But uh, with only the convexity assumption, that's the, you cannot control more than F of Xn minus F of X star. And one last thing I will have to, I have to introduce before really starting the talk uh, is the notion of uh, epsilon solution. So uh, I, I, as I said, I, I want to minimize a function capital F equals small f plus small h. So solution are characterized by the fact that zero belongs to the subdifferential of capital F. So if you don't know the subdifferential of a function, just think of it as a gradient. It's just a generalization of the gradient to, to convex function. And uh, so zero belongs to the subdifferential of capital F. That is that it's uh, the minus the gradient of small f belongs to the subdifferential of uh, small h of x. And in fact, this uh, in inclusion, you can see it as a fixed point. Uh, in fact, uh, zero belongs to the subdifferential of capital F, its equivalent just have to rewrite the, the, the optimality condition to the fact that X is a fixed point of the, the operator prox of gamma H uh, at the point X minus gamma gradient of small f of X. So just to set the notations, prox is the proximal operator and the proximal operator of the, uh, the, the function gamma H at point X. Can I ask a question please? Yeah, sure. Whenever you want. Uh, I, I feel alone, in fact, because I don't have any feedback. <laughs> ah, okay, yeah. Uh, what do you mean by uh, saying zero belong to the derivative of capital X? So, uh, if you don't, uh, if you don't know uh, what the subdifferential is, just think of it as zero is equal to the gradient of uh, capital F. Okay, it's just that the the subdifferential for convex function, which are not differentiable is just a generalization of uh, the classical gradient. And so you, you don't have an equality, uh, you don't have zero equal to the gradient, but you have the fact that zero belongs to the set of the subdifferential of capital F. But just think of it as zero is equal to the gradient of capital F. Ah, okay, thanks, thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much for the question. Um, and so the proximal operator, uh, gamma uh, of a function gamma h at location x is the minimizer of this function here, that is the function gamma h at the point y, 
plus a quadratic perturbation. So this uh, proximal operator is a very uh, is a tool which is very very useful in uh, convex optimization uh, and, and especially in uh, non-smooth convex optimization. But I, I'll get back to it uh, in, a, in, in some a few slides later. Okay, and um, no, what I uh, what I want to say is that I, I'm um, uh, I'm I'm considering iterative schemes, so I'll never get exactly to the solution. Uh, what I want is to be able to say that I'm I've reached a solution up to some accuracy epsilon. And so I will say that Xn is an epsilon solution of my minimization problem if the norm of the function g of Xn is smaller than epsilon. And the fun this function g uh, of x will be defined as uh, L, which is the uh, Lipschitz gradient constant, times x minus the proximal operator 1 over LH at point x minus 1 over L gradient f of x. And this in fact, this, this um, vector is the composite gradient mapping. So it may seem weird why using this function, but in fact, uh, this function, uh, the norm of this function G is equivalent somehow to F of X minus F of X star. In fact, uh, Nesterov showed for instance that one over two L times the square of the, the norm of j of x is smaller than f of x minus f of x star. And we show that uh, f of x plus, where x plus is the, the proximal uh, operator, uh, minus f of x star is smaller than 2 over mu times the, um, the square of the, altru the, the norm of j of x. Of g of x, sorry. So, Basically, if you control f of x minus f of x star, you control j, uh, g of x and, uh, and conversely. And more interesting, if you know, uh, if, you, if you want to, to know when you have reached an epsilon solution, well, if you know that f of x n minus f of x star is smaller than one over two L epsilon square, then you know that x n is, is an epsilon solution of your minimization problem. It's just that it's more easier to, to know the, the infimal value of your functional than the value of the minimizer of the function. And so in the rest of the talk, I will only consider, I, I will consider this uh, concept of epsilon solution. And I will consider that my, my algorithm has written an epsilon solution whenever the uh, norm of G of X n is smaller than epsilon. So uh, before I get to the next part of the talk, are there some questions about, about this introduction? If not... Um, uh, sorry, um, uh, sure? just I wanted to ask a rash question. Hmm? <clears throat> I wanted to know... Uh, how does it differ between quadratic growth condition and Lusajewicz condition? You know, it is for controlling uh, the behavior of convergence. You take these uh, assumptions over the compos composition of SMOS plus non smos function to control the behavior of a convergence point, yeah? Am I right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, um, just, just I wanted to know uh, uh, um, uh, how how much is different between two method uh, from viewpoint of uh, convergence. See, uh, so in the convex setting, yeah. this quadratic growth condition is equivalent to the exactly. logarithmic exactly. property. Exactly. So in the convex setting, they are to, they are equivalent, and we will only consider the convex setting, so they will be equivalent. It's just that, uh, in my view. Uh, it's, I understand uh, more easily from a geometrical point of view, the quadratic growth condition. Well, uh, I, I see what's a quadratic growth condition. But then in the proofs, most of the time, it's easier to use the Loyasevitz property. Sure. So yeah. I would say that from a mathematical point of view, the Loyasevitz property is easier to use. But from a modeling point of view or um, understanding point of view, 
the quadratic growth condition is easier to use. But and, they, will, they are equivalent in the, in the convex uh, set. Uh, yeah, and also for non-convex, it is maybe more complicated, yeah? Maybe. Ah, it's definitely more complicated. Uh -huh. That's, uh, well, but something I, I, I try to know to, to work on. Um, yeah. Indeed, it's a uh, it's a much it's much more uh, much more complicated problem. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. There is an additional question in the chat right now, and that is: um, oh. Do we consider the quadratic growth condition to be true for every minimizer capital X star? Yes, we do. At, uh, for uh, it, it has to be true for any minimizer within the, the minimizing set. And so, um, in the in the definition of the quadratic growth condition, are little x star and capital X star the same? No. Okay. So that's that's a very good qu remark. Uh, so here, um, capital uh, X star is the set of minimizer. and small x star is just a point within the set capital X star. I see. Thank you. But that's something I should have uh, explained. <laughs> um, OK, so now I'm going to present uh, classical results about uh, the forward-backward algorithm and FIST, the FIST algorithm. And then I will um, present new, new results. So as I said, we want to minimize capital F, which is the sum of two functions. We have the optimality condition. And as I explained before, uh, this optimality condition is equivalent to the fact that X is the fixed point of some operator. And once you have a characterization as a fixed point, it's very classical uh, to introduce as a, an algorithm. Uh, to iterate uh, about uh, around this fixed point. So that, that's the principle of the Provodabra algorithm. You start with some point x naught, and then xn plus 1 is the, uh, the proximal operator of gamma h at point xn minus gamma gradient of f at, in xn. Um, so that's very completely uh, standard. And um, the, 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 the step uh, gamma here, in the, the, the talk will be constant, uh, and it has to be chosen uh, small enough, uh, smaller than 2 over L, where L is the Lipschitz uh, constant of the gradient of the function small f. Uh, if you choose gamma equal 1 over L, which is the optimal parameter, in fact, uh, then xn plus 1 is just xn plus, so if you remember my notation, xn, x plus is uh, this proximal operator. Indeed. And so g, g of xn is L times xn minus xn plus 1. And so uh, and xn is an absolute solution if and only if the norm of g of xn is smaller than epsilon, so it's just uh, you, you reach an epsilon solution as soon as xn uh, is close enough to xn plus 1 up to rescaling by uh, the, the, the L parameter. There is another way of seeing the forward backward algorithm. Uh, in fact, you can see it as uh, an algorithm where you uh, minimize uh, some approximation of your function. So instead of minimizing it directly the, the, the function capital F, at each iteration, you will minimize a small h plus the quadratic uh, upper bound of uh, small f. So if you remember, I said that small f is a um, L Lipschitz uh, convex differentiable function. And since it is an L Lipschitz, uh, well, uh, with L Lipschitz gradients uh, convex differentiable function, it, has, it is uh, always upper bounded by this, uh, these three terms, that this uh, quadratic approximation. And so instead of minimizing capital F, I will minimize a small h plus this quadratic uh, upper bound. And if I play with the, with, with the, the norm, in fact, oops, if I play with the norm, 
I'm, I, I get exactly that Xn plus one is defined as uh, in the, the, proxim uh, the proximal operator uh, as in the forward backward algorithm. So you can see the forward backward algorithm either as a fixed point uh, method or as the a method where you've replaced the function small f by its quadratic approximation. In both cases, you get to the same algorithm. Why is it called forward-backward? Uh, it's just because you have a forward step, that is the gradient step, ex explicit step. And then you have a an, uh, backward step, which is a, uh, an implicit step, uh, that is the proximal step. So hence the name forward-backward. So uh, if in the case when small h is zero, and unconstrained optimization, then uh, the proximal operator of small h is just the identity operator. And since it's the identity operator, then the forward backward algorithm is just a classical gradient descent. So everything we'll say about the forward backward algorithm, in particular, is true for the classical uh, gradient descent. If you have, uh, if H is the indicator uh, function of uh, some um, non-empty closed convex set C, this uh, H is zero if you're in the set C and plus infinity of the Y's, then the proximal operator of H is just the orthogonal projection onto C. And thus the forward backward algorithm in that case is just the classical gradient projection algorithm. And so once again, everything we'll say about the forward barcode algorithm is true for the, in particular, for the gradient projection method. And the last example, uh, which is well, one, one a reason why these proximal operators are very often used uh, in non-smooth uh, convex optimization, it's the case when h, the, sorry, the function small h, is the L1 norm, because of course, the L1 norm is not differentiable, so you, you, don't have, you don't like it at first, but the proximal operator of the L1 norm is the self-thresholding operator, and this self-thresholding operator is straightforward to compute. And so that's the main reason why as soon as you have some L1 norm in the criterion you want to minimize, then you, you use proximal methods because the proximal operator of the L1 norm is, uh, is, is free to compute. Okay, so now let's go to uh, convergence speed. So if we have a convex function, then uh, the forward backward algorithm has a convergent rate in one over n. In fact, you can show very easily that f of xn minus f of x star is bounded by some quantity uh, divided by n. So, that's, uh, that's not a very fast convergence, but still it converges to zero. So that's already, that's already, that's already something. And if you want to, 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 to you can turn that result into a, an epsilon solution result. Uh, if you want to be sure that f of xn minus f of x star is a smaller, well, sorry, of, uh, g of xn is smaller than epsilon in norm, then it, you just have to, to assume that f of xn minus f of x star is more than one over two L epsilon square. And so you reach an epsilon solution in some number of iteration that is a big O of uh, one over epsilon square. Um, so for the gradient descent, there was a major uh, improvement in 1984 uh, when Nesterov introduced uh, some uh, inertial method. So the, the algorithm is almost the same as before, you, except that now you have two sequence, yn and xn. But here, if you assume that uh, yn is xn, then this second line is exactly the, the forward backward algorithm. The difference is that you will compute the proximal operator not at the point xn, but at the point yn, which is some uh, extrapolation of xn. 
yn is uh, defined as uh, you, you, you take xn, but you don't stop at xn, you go a little further, you add something which depends on xn minus xn minus one. The, the, the philosophy behind the, the method is that, uh, in fact, just using the, the last point of the sequence uh, is not the best way because you've lost some information. In fact, with the trajectory of the, fun, uh, of the minimization, you have more information. Uh, and so you could use, in fact, all the points along the trajectory to, 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 to get something, fa a fast algorithm. Uh, and in fact, uh, Nesterov showed that only taking the two last points uh, was the way uh, to achieve the best possible rate. You don't need to have the old, uh, old, old trajectory, just taking into account the two last points. And uh, here, the sequence Tn uh, at first was uh, defined by uh, recursivity uh, as uh, the square uh, the solution of a second order uh, function. And from a computational point of view, uh, this algorithm uh, is almost has almost the same price as the forward backward algorithm. You just have this extrapolation step uh, more, but it's uh, straightforward to compute. There are nothing complicated. Oops. Um, and the major results by Nesterov is that it, you can show that with this small modification, you get from a decrease in one over n to a decrease in one over n square. Remember, for for the backward algorithm, the, the function value decreased as one over n. And here, just by adding this extrapolation step, you get to one over n square. So you are really much much faster. And uh, in 1984, uh, I think he made uh, Nesterov <laughs> achieve what is the Graal for any optimi optimizer. He, he, proved, he proposed an algorithm that could converge in one over n square. And he also showed that you cannot do better uh, on the class of, of convex function. And this, uh, this idea of using inertia is uh, really something important in machine learning. That's the basic of uh, the Adarim algorithm, for instance. So uh, you can, can say that uh, for convex function, the prior, everything has been said uh, here. In fact, it's not completely true uh, because you, with Nesterov algorithm, you, you achieve a much faster uh, decrease. You, you get to one over n square, but there's no proof uh, in general that Xn is a converging sequence. In fact, it's still an open question uh, in general. Uh, is uh, Nesterov acceleration uh, providing a converging sequence for a convex function. You know that f of xn converges very fast to f of x star, but uh, yeah, there is no proof that xn converges also to x star. And there was uh, a work by uh, Antonin Chambol and Charles Dossal, where they proposed a slight modification of uh, Nesterov algorithm. In fact, instead of using the sequence Tn, they use uh, a sequence which is n divided by n plus alpha, so an explicit sequence. And in fact, when you use alpha equal three in the, the, this uh, definition, uh, you, uh, you you get exactly the same uh, behavior for the algorithm as the uh, Nesterov original choice. So alpha equal three corresponds to the original Nesterov proposition. And if alpha is strictly larger than three, uh, then uh, Chambol and Dossal showed that this algorithm converges uh, to X star, and you still have uh, the decrease in one over n square. And so to reach an epsilon solution, you're in big O of one over epsilon, uh, while you were in big O of one over epsilon square for the forward backward algorithm. I have a question for the sure. Nesterov's accelerated. Do you have a counterexample where XN doesn't converge? No, I don't. <laughs> it's, so uh, there is none. It's, it's just conjectured that it, XN is convergent. Yeah, um, I, I believe it's converging, but uh, I, I, don't, I don't know of any proof that it converges uh, in general for alpha equal free. There are proof in 1D, but uh, as soon as you get in 2D, in, in fact, you can 
think that you may diverge as uh, with uh, some logarithmic uh, spiral. But uh, anyway, numerically, if it's a uh, logarithmic, logarithmic uh, di divergence, you won't see it, it will converge. But here for alpha greater than three, the iterates XM converges. Yeah, it's with alpha same. larger than three, strictly, uh, then you're, you're okay. Why is that? I mean, do you have a quick explanation of why three? Ah, um, why? I'll try to get the why the the choice three. Uh, I'll I'll get back to it later. But uh, okay. there's a there's an easy explanation for that. <laughs> okay, thanks. And uh, in the rest of the talk, um, when I will uh, say uh, talk about Nestor algorithm, I will uh, in fact use this version of the algorithm with the n over n plus alpha, uh, which is equivalent for alpha equal, alpha equal three to the original choice of Nesterov, but it, which is much easier to to analyze. In fact. Okay, so here we were in the, in the convex case. Now, let's go to the strongly convex case, or uh, at least uh, if you assume some quadratic growth condition. Uh, in that uh, in that case, uh, far forward backward, you can get a much better convergence result rate, uh, convergence speed. Sorry. Uh, for instance, uh, Guillaume Garrigos and the co-authors show that uh, in fact you have. Um, an exponential decrease, uh, f of xn minus f of x star is bounded by one minus kappa to the power n times f of x naught minus f of x star. So you get from a polynomial decrease to an exponential decrease. So which is of course much better. And you can also uh, write it, uh, see it as a, in term of uh, epsilon solution, you're, you're assured to reach an epsilon solution. So for kappa small, in uh, something which is one over kappa log of one of epsilon. In the case of the FIST algorithm, uh, several versions of, of, of the results, um, but uh, what you can show is that f of xn minus f of x star is, is a, a big O of n to the power minus two alpha divided by three. So that's also uh, much better the one over the, than the one over n square that we had uh, only for convex uh, function. And also, uh, of course, the larger alpha, the better you, you get a convergence rate. So you can be as fast as you want. Nevertheless, FISTA here uh, only uh, give a polynomial decrease while in the same setting, far forward backward, you have uh, a geometrical decrease. So what you have to realize is that for the class of convex function, FISTA is an acceleration. You get from one over n square to, to one over n to one over n square in terms of speed of decrease. But when you restrict yourself to the class of strongly convex function or a function with quite a growth condition, still convex, then FISTA is um, is a is a, is a just a, a decrease of the classical forward backward algorithm. Forward backward on this subclass it has a, a geometrical convergence rate, while uh, FISTA for the same class of function, and you can show that this rate is optimal, has only a polynomial decrease. So always, uh, when you want to know if uh, if you have an acceleration, ask the question on which class of function it's an acceleration. Nevertheless, uh, if you do some experiments here, it's an image processing uh, experiment. Uh, on the top row, I have uh, an image I want to, to restore. Uh, it's a plain image. And on the bottom row, I have the result I get on the left uh, with uh, the forward backward algorithm and on the right with the FIST algorithm. And uh, on the top right, you can see the decrease of the, 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 function value, the functional value. And if you just have the, the, the blue curve, uh, which is the forward backward, you may have the feeling that you've already reached the minimum because it's almost flat. 
But if you look at the curve of the energy for the feast algorithm, you see that you decrease uh, much more and you can go much below. And if you look at the, the images, you can see that uh, with the, the one you get with forward backward, you still have some halo around the, the, the person or down the plane. Clearly, you've not reached convergence, while with FISTA, you, you, you have a much better result. So that's kind of weird because here, uh, forward backward is, uh, has a um, geometrical convergence rate. Yeah, we, we are a strong convex. Uh, FISTA has only a polynomial convergence rate. And nevertheless, the polynomial convergence rate uh, seems to be better than the geometrical convergence rate. Another example uh, here in, um, uh, uh, least square problem. Uh, so in blue, you have the the, the value of uh, log of uh, logarithm of the norm of g of x n, which is our criterion to get an epsilon solution. So in blue, it's for forward backward, and uh, in yellow, green, and uh, gray, you have the the the, the for the, the feast algorithm with different values of alpha. And again, it looks like the, the polynomial decay uh, seems to do a better job than the uh, geometrical decay. So the question is why? Uh, but before trying to answer that, uh, I want to mention another algorithm, uh, which was also introduced by Nesterov. Uh, for the class of strongly convex function. So I will call this algorithm NSC in the, the rest of the talk. Uh, so it's very similar to the classical Nesterov algorithm. The difference is that here, the inertia is constant. It's always one over minus uh, square root of kappa divided by one plus square root of kappa. Well, in Nesterov algorithm, the, the inertia, uh, inertia depended on uh, the the, the iteration number here for strongly convex, the, the inertia is constant and depends on the, the quantity kappa, the, which is uh, mu divided by L. And if you choose this constant inertia, uh, what you can show uh, is that you have uh, a geometrical convergence rate and a geometrical convergence rate, which depends on the quantity one minus square root of kappa to the power N. So remember that I told you that kappa is, uh, is small in, since we deal with large scale optimization. So um, in fact, kappa is a small O of square root of kappa. So the decrease one minus square root of kappa to the power n, one minus of uh, square root of kappa to the power n goes much faster to zero than one minus kappa to the power n. And one minus kappa to the power n was the, the, the geometric roll rate we had with the forward backward algorithm. And so uh, for large scale optimization, for strongly convex function, uh, this uh, algorithm will be much, much more uh, efficient than the forward backward algorithm. In fact, that's also something I, I want to, to, to point out is that in many papers, people say, well, we have a geometrical convergence rate, but in fact, when you say that, you have not say much, it depends on uh, what's within the geometrical uh, constant. If you are too close to one, then you may still be very slow. And uh, here, uh, having a square root of kappa instead of uh, kappa for kappa small is a major difference. And in terms of epsilon solution, uh, if kappa is small, so you get that uh, you, you reach an epsilon solution in at most uh, one over square root of kappa, logarithm of one over epsilon. Uh, for those who know about it, you, know, you, got, you have also similar results for the heavy ball algorithm. So here again, uh, a numerical example. Uh, so in blue, it's still the forward barcode algorithm. In green, that's the Nesterov uh, scheme for strongly convex function with uh, using the the, 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 the full value of mu for the function. So as expected, that's the best uh, convergence rate. And in red and yellow, you have uh, the feast algorithm, so which 
is not as good as the, the Nesterov scheme for strongly convex function, but still, which does a better job than the forward backer algorithm. And also, uh, if I uh, underestimate the value of mu by a factor 10, which is not much, in fact, uh, most of the time, the, the quadratic growth parameter, you, it's not very, it's not easy to estimate it. So you, uh, underestimating by a factor 10 is, is not much. Well, that's the gray curve. And you see that then uh, phi star does a better job than the, the gray curve. And still, uh, you have to keep in mind that uh, the blue, gray, and green curve uh, correspond to geometrical decay, while the um, red and yellow curve corresponds to uh, polynomial decay. Okay, so in the next part, I will try to explain why uh it's um from where, where, where why this uh we have this uh, paradox that uh polynomial decay can beat a geometrical decay are there some questions before i start uh, i start the next part i have a question if you run this for many many iterations then the picture should be reversed right you should have the exponential decay much uh, much better than the the rest the polynomial ones yes you're completely right you in fact you, you I, I i bet you've already uh, read the, the 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 rest of the presentation everything mm -hmm. is in uh, but it's exponential is yeah yeah everything is uh, different between an asymptotic convergence rate and the finite time uh, convergence uh, convergence rate. In fact, mm -hmm. here you see on the curve, I'm already at almost four four thousand uh, iterations, so that's a lot. Um, what is important is to have an algorithm that gets quite fast to to the result, not one that uh, will get to the result in uh, a time you can't Eventually. wait for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But uh, of course, uh, there's no no miracle. Uh, a geometrical decay, if you have enough time, will always be better than a polynomial decay. It's just that uh, in a, in our in our true in our world, uh, you deal with a finite time, and so uh, polynomial decay can be faster. But out of curiosity, what what is the function here you optimize? Here, uh, it's just a um, it's just a, a least square problem. It's a completely standard. Right, but the parameters. I mean, it's a least square, but you have to estimate the kappa. What is yeah? Kappa uh, okay. Uh, I, um, here, uh, okay. I I, I, um, I I estimated the the, the mu and the l, and uh, I, I had everything. So that's why the in the in green. Uh, I was uh, I have the, the exact parameters, but it's just you know uh, an illustration. It's not uh, here. It's not a, a real application. It's just yeah. to say if I know the parameter, then it works perfectly well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, just how much time do still do I have still? Uh, um. So we've got 10 minutes in total left. Uh, so about five minutes for the talk and five minutes for questions. But there have also been a lot of questions already. So if you, at most 10 minutes. Okay. Now, um, so I, I, won't, uh, I will skip part three of the talk, sure. And I will just try to, to get through part two uh, fast enough. <laughs> Uh, just to try to explain the, the, this paradox. Okay, so we have uh, the FIST algorithm and we have our stopping criterion. Uh, that is, uh, we want to, to st we stop the algorithm when we have reached an epsilon solution. And what we want to get, as I explained, uh, is to get a finite time uh, bounds on the decrease of f of xn minus f of x star. And to do so, uh, we are going to use the um, dynamical system intuition. So the idea, in fact, is to um, rethink uh, discrete algorithms uh, as uh, discretization 
of uh, classical or ordinary differential equations. So for instance here, that's the classical gradient descent. Xn plus one is equal to Xn plus S times the gradient, uh, minus S times the gradient of F in Xn. So that's a classical gradient descent uh, with a constant time step S. It's straightforward to see that you can see it as a discretization of the first order ODE, X dot plus the gradient of F at point X of T is zero. And why is it uh, interesting? It's because it's much easier, to, in fact, to analyze the, the continuous ODE than the discrete uh, scheme. Uh, what is awesome with a continuous ODE is that you have tools such as uh, differentiation that you don't have in discrete, or at least you, know, you have to make differences. And so all the computations are much, much easier in the continuous case. And from the, the analysis in the continuum, then you can get uh, intuition on how to, to lead the, the, the computation in discrete. So just an, a basic example uh, with the, the first order of D, uh, you take as a Lyapunov function, you take E of T equal F of X of T minus F of X star. So Lyapunov function, the function that uh, whose value decreases along the, the trajectory of the OD. If you compute the derivative e prime, that's minus uh, the actual norm of the gradient. So it's always negative. So you have, at once you have that the value of the function is decreasing on the trajectory. And if you assume furthermore that f is mu strongly convex, and as I said, it's equivalent that uh, f satisfies the um, Lyapunov's property with exponent one over two. Well, then it's straightforward to get that uh, E prime of T is smaller than minus two mu of E of T. And so from there, you get that you have uh, the exponential decay for F. You can do the same job in discrete, and uh, but I will pass it. It's just more complicated, but it, uh, you get the same kind of results. Um, now let's go to the, the OD associated to the to Nesterov scheme. So the scheme is uh, xn plus one is equal to yn minus s times the gradient of f in yn with yn, which is the extrapolation of xn. In fact, if you plug the value of yn here within this equation, you can rewrite it and you get this uh, equation. And here, the three first terms you recognize a discretization of x, uh, the second order derivative of x with respect to t. Here you have a uh, discretization of x dot and, uh, times alpha over t. And here you have a discretization of the gradient of f. And so instead of analyzing the Nesterov scheme, what you are we're going to do now is to analyze this ODE, a second order ODE, with a vanishing uh, term here uh, for x dot. It will be much easier to analyze. So uh, for the analysis, we can, you, we, we can get a uh, convergence rate uh, depending on the value of alpha. So for uh, alpha larger than three, we have the convergence of the va functional value in uh, capital O of an over T square. And for alpha smaller than three, we, have no con we cannot show the convergence of the sequence, but we have still a, a convergence in capital O of one over T to the power of two alpha by, uh, divided by three. And why, uh, why alpha equal three is important? So that's your question, question Stefan. In fact, uh, if you use this Lyapunov function, so you take, you take t squared times f of x t minus f of x four, and you add here this term one over two plus times alpha minus one x, x of t minus x star plus t x dot of t square, you differentiate it. You play with the term. You use the fact that your function is convex to, to, to say that this quantity is always larger than f of x t minus f of x star. And eventually, what you get is that the derivative of e is smaller than 3 minus alpha t times f of f of t minus f of x star. And so that's the reason why alpha equals 3 is the, 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 the key point. If I quite f i is equal to three, then e prime is just smaller than zero. If it's larger than uh, strictly, then it's uh, decreasing. And if it's not, 
If it's more than then uh, you have to work more to to get decrease. But the the, the key value alpha that it's uh, around three, it only comes from this equation. And you can get the same result uh, in discrete, uh, except that you replace the one over t square by one over n square. Okay, so in finite uh, time, what we did is that we, we use a slight, uh, another Lyapunov functional, uh, slight modification. Um, so we still get the first, the same first term, t squared times f of x of c minus f of x star. And here in the second part, we have uh, lambda times f of x t minus x star plus t x dot of t, and we choose lambda equal to alpha over three. And I, I'll skip the computation, but if we work a little, uh, well, yeah, in fact, more than a little, it's uh, <laughs> the, the, this computation are quite long. You eventually end up with a uh, bound like f of f of x t minus f of x star is smaller than some constant times the quantity alpha divided by t square root of mu to the power two alpha divided by three. And that's really important. This quantity in red, that's what will be controlling in fact the decrease of the functional. If we make some rough computations, uh, so uh, getting an epsilon solution, a sufficient condition is that f of f of t minus f of x star is more than epsilon square. So uh, if we forget the constant, that is just the right term here, the right term smaller than epsilon square. And we can solve the equation. We get that t needs to be larger than alpha divided by square root of mu to the times one over epsilon to the power of three divided by alpha. And so we are uh, nothing new. We are back to a polynomial decay. But what you have to keep in mind is that here, I, uh, I've set the epsilon accuracy I want. So once I've set this accuracy, I can choose alpha in the algorithm. And so if I choose alpha uh, proportional to the logarithm of one over epsilon, I can do exactly the same computations and uh, same computation than before. And I get that I reach an epsilon solution as soon as t is larger than uh, some constant divided by square root of mu times the logarithm of one over epsilon. And this corresponds to a fast exponential decay. So it's, uh, if I choose the accuracy epsilon, if I, if I set it, then I can uh, choose alpha in the Nesterov algorithm so that I get a fast exponential decay. Of course, I just reached an epsilon solution. Uh, it's not an asymptotic uh, convergence rate. And you can, you can, you, you can write a theorem in, uh, in discrete. Uh, so I, I won't go into the detail, but uh, what, you say, what you can say that if you fix some accuracy epsilon, oops, then you can choose alpha, which depend on epsilon. It basically depends on logarithm of one over epsilon. And then the sequence generated by the FIST algorithm uh, is such that you are sure to reach an epsilon solution as soon as the number of iteration is of the order one over, uh, over square root of kappa times logarithm of one over epsilon. So it means that you have reached your epsilon solution with a fast exponential decay. So this is my one minute warning. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, that's just uh, the reason why uh, in finite time, uh, forward backward is much is much less efficient than the, than the FIST algorithm. Because for forward backward in finite time, we are in one over kappa times log, log of one over epsilon. While for FISTA, you're in uh, one over square root of kappa, logarithm of one over epsilon. And since kappa is small, the one over square root of kappa is much better. Uh, if you know exactly the parameters, of course, uh, the version uh, by Nesterov uh, for strongly convex function is always faster. But if you underestimate the, the, the parameters, then again, since you are uh, in both cases, you are in one over square root of kappa times logarithm of one over epsilon, you can be better with FISTA 
uh, and without uh, the, the having to know the, the value uh, of your parameters. Okay. And uh, just to finish on this slide uh, with uh, the convergence results in asymptotic and in uh, finite time for the, the algorithm I've discussed in this talk and say that, uh, of course, the next step will be to remove the convexity assumption on the function uh, capital F, uh, because uh, what we want to do now is to, to be able to, to deal with uh, classical machine learning problems. And so for that, we, we have to, to remove this assumption. So we'll have to get to new Lyapunov functions. Uh, but uh, well, it's, it's not easy, but it's exciting. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I'll be happy to answer all, all your questions.